Praxeology and Understanding, an Analysis of the Controversy in Austrian Economics, by George A. Selgin. The law of sufficient reason states the minimum amount of connection and order in the world which is necessary if we are to have a chance to understand and control it. Thus, the law asserts, there is not unlimited possibility present in our world. Whatever occurs, a battle, a change in the government, or in the economic system, or the like, it is not true that everything or anything else could have happened. The principle of sufficient reason obviously cannot be proved objectively. That is, we cannot prove that it was impossible for everything which has happened to have been different, and we certainly cannot prove that the present constitution of the world is such that only certain things will happen and that nothing else can possibly occur. It is rather a postulate of science to satisfy the demand for understanding. By assuming, therefore, that everything has certain determinate relations to certain definite other elements, we have a reason for seeking to find them, and the success of science, or its programs, encourages us to believe that further relations can be discovered if we persist in our search. Morris Cohen the Meaning of Human History, pages 97 and 100. We live in a world full of contradiction and paradox, a fact of which perhaps the most fundamental illustration is this, that the existence of a problem of knowledge depends on the future being different from the past, while the possibility of the solution of the problem depends on the future being like the past. Frank Knight, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, page 313. Austrian economics emerged in rebellion against skepticism. The predominant economic doctrine in continental Europe at the time of its founding, that championed by the German historical school under Gustav Schmoller, rejected the idea of an economic science devoted to the explanation of market phenomena in terms of exact and universal laws. It proposed instead historical description and interpretation of social events devoid of any reference to universal or exact laws and to pure economic theories based on them. Today, Austrian economics is challenged by skepticism once again. The new threat is not historicism per se, but the unorthodox views of G.L.S. Shackle and his Austrian followers. According to Shackle, the future is unknowable and colliding, that is, dominated by patternless change. Action in the marketplace, to be rational, requires that actors in the marketplace be able to anticipate the behavior of their fellows. Theory cannot explain why such anticipations should, except by mere chance, be correct. Thus the idea that action is purposeful, which lies at the heart of the conventional Austrian approach to economic theory, is questioned, and new doubt is cast upon the meaningfulness of economic science. This has led to a controversy within the Austrian school that is the subject of the present analysis. Before examining this controversy, it will be necessary to review the methodological tenets of Austrian economics. In particular, it will be useful to examine the method of praxeology, which forms the basis for the Austrian defense of the possibility and validity of pure, i.e. universal economic theory. The investigation will then proceed to analyze the ideas of F. A. Hayek, G. L. S. Shackle, and Ludwig M. Lachmann, insofar as they have cast suspicion upon the praxeological approach as it was originally conceived by Mises. Finally, the analysis will turn to the issues of equilibration, coordination, and determinism that occupy central stage in current Austrian debate. It attempts to resolve the conflicts concerning these issues by offering new arguments based on the application of radical subjectivism consistent with the praxeological framework. The article concludes with a critical assessment of proposed changes in the Austrian research program. Praxeology, the method of economic theory. The most conscientious and extensive development of the methodological doctrines of the Austrian school was undertaken by Ludwig von Mises. Mises viewed his efforts as an elaboration and extension of the beliefs of Karl Menger, the school's founder. Menger's views developed during the course of the famous Methodenstreit, which pitted him against the anti-theoretical doctrines of the German historical school. Lachmann aptly notes 
that Mises saw in Menger's distinction between exact laws and empirical regularities the pivot of Austrian methodology. Mises's particular elaboration of the Austrian method, which he called praxeology, is still regarded by many Austrian economists as the method of the Austrian school. In refining Menger's ideas, Mises had to confront new opposition in the form of the doctrines of logical positivism. Mises saw in positivism the same epistemological presumptions that were at work in historicism, namely, a denial of the existence of universal and necessary laws independent of concrete historical events. To Mises, this view was grounded in fallacy. We are not capable of conceiving a world in which things would not run their course according to eternal pitiless grand laws. But this much is clear to us. In a world so constituted, human thought and rational human action would not be possible. And therefore in such a world, there could be neither human beings nor logical thought. Empiricism, beginning with Hume's skepticism, and including all of its positivist variants, shares the historicist's denial of necessity. It attempts to salvage the categories of law and theory by invoking the procedure of induction, i.e., the derivation of theory from the generalization of observed conjunctions of historical events. However, empiricism has yet to solve the problem of induction. It cannot, on the basis of its own epistemological tenets, offer a satisfactory basis for the assumption that its generalizations apply with equal force to future events. Thus, empiricism does not provide a true alternative to historicism. It leaves intact the claim, disputed by Menger and by Mises, that scientific knowledge consists entirely of generalizations drawn from past experience that could always be upset by some later experience. In countering positivism, Mises took refuge in Kantian epistemology, and especially in Kant's defense of the category of the synthetic a priori. What Mises regarded as crucial in Kant was, however, not Kant's formal analysis of a priori knowledge or his epistemological idealism, but rather his conviction contra empiricism and historicism that reason could give universal and necessary knowledge, knowledge that was fresh and informative. In the sense in which he applied it in economics, Mises's a priorism did not differ fundamentally from Menger's Aristotelian essentialism. Praxeology represents an attempt to escape the nihilistic implications of both historicism and empiricism. It affirms the operation of inviolable laws within the realm of human action. It purports to establish the universal validity of these laws by deducing them from the allegedly incontestable truth that people act purposefully, the axiom of action. Although supposedly irrefutable, this axiom is not merely analytic, i.e. non-empirical or vacuous. It is based upon the reality of the pursuit of ends and the choice of means for their attainment that distinguishes all mental and hence human activity. Thus, a priori, for Mises, means independent of any particular time or place. It does not imply independence from all experience, although it does denote independence from the sort of sensory experience that empiricism and positivism emphasize. It rests on universal inner experience and not simply on external experience, i.e., its evidence is reflective rather than physical. Sense data alone, on the other hand, could not reveal to us the essential purposefulness of human actions. Nor is experience of the empiricist variety effective in refuting theories derived praxeologically. Rather, refutation of a praxeological theory requires discovery of a fault in the chain of reasoning employed by the praxeologist. Empirical evidence does not falsify a theory, but rather serves to establish the appropriateness of the theory's application to a particular concrete event. To meaningfully deny the action axiom, i.e. the claim that people act purposefully, is difficult. Denial of the axiom's empirical validity involves a purposeful act on the part of skeptics. It therefore confronts them with the uncomfortable choice of either conceding the issue or proclaiming that their own disagreement is purposeless. Thus, any denial of the action axiom is self-contradictory. Yet it is neither empty nor arbitrary. It is axiomatic in the sense that distinguishes an axiom from a postulate. It is epistemologically distinct 
from the a priori assumptions employed in the hypothetical deductive procedures of orthodox neoclassical economics. To be sure, Mises would have insisted that all of the lasting discoveries of the classical and neoclassical economists in the realm of pure theory were in fact results of the method described by praxeology. But this was by no means the acknowledged procedure of these schools of thought. Neoclassical economics regards even its most fundamental laws as contingent or probable. Indeed, many of its modern theorems are based upon patently false assumptions, some selected for their alleged predictive capacity, and all subject to empirical testing and falsification. The fundamental laws of praxeology are, in contrast, held by it to be universally valid. They hold with apodictic certainty. Mises was heavily influenced by Max Weber, as well as by Kant. It was from Weber that Mises took the notion of purposefulness, which he made the starting point of praxeological analysis. Mises also adopted Weber's emphasis upon methodological individualism and his insistence upon the necessity and possibility of an entirely value-free, wertfrei, science of human action. Using these notions, Mises refined Menger's development of the subjective theory of value. Mises's extended application of praxeological subjectivism may be viewed as a limited version of the doctrine of epistemological subjectivism or idealism. It maintains that within the realm of human action, there are phenomena, in particular market phenomena, that exist only by virtue of the consciousness of purposeful individuals. Thus, value, wealth, profit, loss, and cost are products of human thought, having no objective or extensive foundation. One cannot imagine their existence or conceive their alteration except in connection with acts of valuation and choice. I shall have occasion to insist upon the consistent application of this subjective doctrine later on in this article. Thus, to explain market phenomena in a manner consistent with its subjectivism, praxeology refers to acts of valuation and choice. However, praxeological subjectivism is also value-free or non-normative. It does not pass judgment on action, but takes it exactly as it is, and it explains market phenomena not on the basis of right action, but on the basis of given action. It does not seek to explain the exchange ratios that would exist on the assumption that men are governed exclusively by certain motives, and that other motives, which do in fact govern them, have no effect. It wants to comprehend the formation of exchange ratios that actually appear in the market. Praxeology is also distinct from psychology. Although it explains market phenomena in terms of individual purposefulness, it does not seek to identify the motivations, thoughts, and ends that give rise to particular purposes and choices. The inability of the praxeologists, as pure theorists, to identify the ends of acting individuals also prevents them from constructing categories of economic and non-economic action. Moreover, it prohibits them from passing judgment on the appropriateness of individual choices. Because praxeology does not judge actions, it is also not in a position to regard any act as irrational. It recognizes that all acts of choice have meaning to the individual choosers in terms of some goal or purpose, however peculiar or ephemeral, that directs their actions. The idea of an action not in conformity with needs is absurd. As soon as one attempts to distinguish between the need and the action, and makes the need the criterion for judging the action, one leaves the domain of theoretical science with its neutrality in regard to value judgments. This application of subjectivism freed praxeology from psychological or normative assumptions and made it the analysis of the pure logic of choice. Through it, economics could become a means for the discovery of universal truths. Subjectivism was not wanted for its own sake, but as a means toward the Austrian quest for elements of necessity within the sequence of social events. Ideal Types and Exact Laws Praxeological theories, as understood by Mises, are independent of the particular psychological makeup of individuals. 
Praxeology does not address the content of individual preferences or the particular motives that give rise to those preferences. It is concerned with the pure logic of choice. Concrete individual ends and values have historical but not theoretical significance. That is, they are relevant to all applications of pure theory to particular historical circumstances, but enter only as auxiliary assumptions in constructing theory itself. Individual ends and calculations undergo continuous inexplicable change and cannot be the subject of anything like exact laws. In the words of Frank Knight, a non-Austrian defender of the praxeological method, there are no laws regarding the content of economic behavior, but there are laws universally valid as to its form. There is an abstract rationale of all conduct which is rational at all and a rationale of social relations arising through the organization of rational activity. To distinguish its universally valid content from history, praxeology had to show that its most fundamental theoretical conclusions, its theoretical hard core, was not based upon the imputation of some typical motivations or values to acting people. For this reason, Mises, while adopting many of Max Weber's methodological prescriptions, regarded the latter's ideal type constructs as unnecessary to the development of pure theory. For Mises, the laws of praxeology did not refer to ideal, typical, rational, or economic people, but to acting people as such. Only in this way could those laws be universal, or in Menger's word, exact. Weber, in contrast, had been unable to accept Menger's notion of exact laws in economics. Thus he regarded the law of diminishing marginal utility and other fundamental discoveries of the pure logic of choice as pragmatic rather than necessary truths. Weber considered economic theory dependent upon the assumption of special kinds of action that might in fact only loosely approximate the actions of people in the real world. In particular, Weber referred to a type of rational man who was a throwback to the economic man of the classical economists. Mises, in contrast, held that such an approach was, first of all, wholly inapplicable to the subjective value theory, and further, that it failed to solve the question of the source of this knowledge of purely economic behavior. A more fundamental problem with the ideal type approach is recognized by Israel Kirzner in his book, The Economic Point of View. It is apparent, Kirzner writes, that when conformity to an ideal type must be assumed for the deductions of the propositions of economics, these propositions cease to be logical implications of actions, and economics ceases to be a branch of praxeology. In other words, economic laws become contingent rather than necessary, and the ideal type approach fails to provide economic theory with an epistemological basis that frees it from the defects of positivism and historicism. Alfred Schutz, in his 1932 book, The Phenomenology of the Social World, accepted Mises's criticisms of Weber and attempted to incorporate these into his own adaptation and generalization of Weber's method. Schutz proposed an ideal type for acting man which would possess the universal applicability needed for the construction of pure economic theory. According to Schutz, ideal types of this sort do not refer to any individual or spatiotemporal collection of individuals. They are statements about anyone's action, about action or behavior considered as occurring in complete anonymity and without any specification of time or place. They are precisely for that reason lacking in concreteness. Schutz observed, using words taken from Mises, that any principle derived from such constructs is not a statement about what usually happens, but of what necessarily must happen. Schutz here stretches the meaning of the ideal type so as to include constructs so typical or general that no action can be conceived that does not conform to them. If we so define ideal type to include a type of mankind as such, then we may conclude that praxeological theories must also be based exclusively 
on the use of ideal typical constructs. The significance of Schutz's work to Austrian economics lies not in this semantic innovation, but rather in Schutz's use of more narrow ideal types to derive what he calls a common sense understanding of social phenomena. This common sense approach is, however, not based upon the anonymous ideal type for mankind as such. It is, as is readily apparent from Schutz's own discussion of it, a historical value-laden approach. In order to explain human actions, the scientist has to ask what model of an individual mind can be constructed and what typical contents must be attributed to it in order to explain observed facts as the results of the activity of such a mind in an understandable relation. These models, Schutz continues, are models of rational actions, but not of actions performed by living human beings in situations defined by them. It is clear that Schutz is describing a procedure that Mises would have regarded as historical, i.e. suitable for examining particular concrete cases, rather than praxeological. Mises's distinction between theory and history was a sharp one, and I shall have occasion to discuss it later. What must now be understood is that for Mises, economic theory rests upon a body of certain truths independent of time and place. Presence of such a pure theoretical foundation distinguishes praxeology from types of economic analysis that regard even their most fundamental assertions as empirical, i.e., as historically limited in nature. For Weber, in contrast, as Mises interpreted him, the difference between praxeology and history is considered as only one of degree. They are different merely in the extent of their proximity to reality, their fullness of content, and the purity of their ideal typical construction. Thus, Max Weber has implicitly answered the question that had once constituted the Methodenstreit, the famous battle of methods in which Karl Menger defended theoretical analysis against the attacks of the historical school entirely in the sense of those who denied the logical legitimacy of a theoretical science of social phenomena. According to him, praxeology is logically conceivable only as a special qualified kind of historical investigation. In the analysis of history, which for Mises includes most applied economics, the use of content-laden ideal types is unavoidable in order to render meaningful in other than a logical sense, the particular acts of persons and the concrete consequences that arise from and in turn influence those acts, one needs to impute to the persons in question a framework of motivations, ends and imagined means, thus making their behavior understandable. This method of historical understanding of Verstehen, which is the same as Schutz's common sense approach to observed facts, goes beyond the logical necessary aspects of action and attempts to reconstruct the psychological content and orientation of actions. It analyzes actions not merely by referring to human purposefulness, but by attempting to comprehend the subjective meaning attached to actions by the actors themselves. As such, its constructs cannot refer only to the anonymous figure of acting man or man as such, but instead must refer to preference-laden, idealized individuals. For Mises, history deals with the concrete manifestations of action. For history, he observed, the main question is, what was the meaning the actors attached to the situation in which they found themselves, and what was the meaning of their reaction? And finally, what was the result of these actions? In an important sense, then, the pure theory that forms the heart of praxeological analysis requires a type of subjectivism distinct from the subjectivism needed in historical analysis. Praxeologists, as developers of pure theory, must consider market phenomena without presuming any knowledge of agents' preferences and beliefs. They must view the world not as understanding beings employing common sense to interpret a specific historical event, but as theorists in search of the logical patterns that underlie the actions of all understanding individuals. Of course, even pure economic theory is affected to some degree by considerations of history, but these considerations mainly refer to the problem 
of whether a certain theory is relevant to a particular historical phenomenon under investigation. Thus, the law of diminishing marginal utility and its immediate corollaries apply with certainty to any historical situation where at least one purposeful individual must dispose of or sacrifice multiple units of a good. The Ricardian law of association, in contrast, applies only where there are numerous individuals engaged in exchange. That is, it is a law pertaining to market phenomena, or what Hayek called catalactics. Other praxeological laws and theories rely upon lengthier chains of reasoning into which a variety of assumptions enter. These are hypothetical deductive theories, although their starting point is the certain fact of purposefulness, the auxiliary assumptions involved may or may not conform to any particular historical circumstance. Finally, praxeology includes exercises in conjectural history in which reference is made to specific institutions, money, central banking, circumstances, monopoly, and policies, tariffs, taxation. Such conjectural histories, therefore, make use of ideal type constructs. These constructs, to be sure, never refer to ideal typical people, but only to ideal type objects or consequences of action, although their truth follows apodictically wherever all the real life equivalents of the specified ideal types are present in a given historical circumstance. Causal genetic or evolutionary theories, such as Menger's theory of the origin of money, fall into this category of conjectural history. Praxeologists may sometimes refer to actual historical events in order to illustrate theoretical results. Here, however, a casual exercise in history proper, and therefore a departure from pure theory, is involved. All examinations of particular historical policies and institutions, e.g. all applied economics, which to be sure includes most of what economists do, are nevertheless outside the realm of pure theory and necessarily rely upon assumptions about individual motives and values. Thus, actual history, unlike the conjectural histories of the praxeologist, makes use of ideal type constructs, not only of institutions, policies, and industrial circumstances, but also of acting individuals. It seeks to understand the specific meaning of historical market phenomena by referring to common sense interpretations based upon values and goals imputed to the actors involved. The dividing line between theory, i.e. praxeology, and history, in Mises' strict sense, is thus marked by the need to employ psychological understanding or common sense. Common sense, however, is not used only by social scientists. Praxeology recognizes it as an essential tool of all people who act in the social world. All entrepreneurial action, i.e. speculative action in the marketplace, requires understanding of other people's motives and intentions. To know the future reactions of other people is the first task of acting man. Knowledge of their past value judgments and actions, although indispensable, is only a means to this end. Thus, while history and common sense or psychological understanding of people's past values and actions are essential for understanding the future, they are not necessarily sufficient. Moreover, entrepreneurship derives only limited practical guidance from praxeology, the predictions of which being simply examples of its conjectural histories, are always qualitative and contingent. They cannot inform us of the actual choices people will make. The a priori discipline of human action, praxeology, does not deal with the actual content of value judgments. It deals only with the fact that men value and then act according to their valuations. What we know about the actual content of judgments of value can be derived only from experience. With these considerations in mind, it is possible to state the dilemma at the heart of the present controversy in Austrian economics. If, in fact, action in society implies understanding of other men's reactions, and no action can be planned or executed without an understanding of the future, then how can praxeology proceed to the elucidation of market phenomena unless it first addresses 
the main epistemological problem of understanding. How can a man have any knowledge of the future value judgments and actions of other people? The current controversy within the Austrian school is due mainly to the conviction on the part of some Austrians that praxeology must address and resolve this problem of understanding. Otherwise, its theorems must be regarded not as necessary truths about the world, but as empty and arbitrary tautologies referring to a hypothetical society populated not necessarily by man as such, but by understanding man, not by homo agents, but by homo percipients, perceiving man, and even more crucially, by homo divinans, man who grasps the future.